In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. This is February the 21st, in the first week of Septuagesima. Mother Church is still drawing our minds to the book of Genesis, which is about 6,000 years ago, was the first creation of the first day. The earth is no, not much older than 6,000 years old. It's not millions and millions of years old. And in this reading of today in the breviary, it takes us to Cain and Abel. And it says this, And again she brought forth Eve, she brought forth his brother Abel after Cain. And Abel was a shepherd, and Cain a husbandman. So Abel looked, took after, looked after sheep, and Cain had a huge garden with vineyards. And it came to pass after many days that Cain offered of the fruits of the earth gifts to the Lord. Now, <clears throat> it doesn't say it explicitly, but later it says God was not pleased with Cain's offerings, because Cain did not offer the best. And that's the point that's made for Abel. Abel offered his fattest, his healthiest, his strongest lambs to God as a sacrifice. So, given that, he was sacrificing the, the best for God and saving the second best and the third best and the worst for himself. He gave the best for God. But Cain, he gave the grapes that had stains on them. He gave the second best to God. And that's why God wasn't pleased with him. And it came to pass after many days, Cain offered of the fruits of the earth gifts to the Lord. Abel offered also of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offerings. So God was pleased with Abel's sacrificing of the lamb. But to Cain and his offerings, he had no respect, meaning he was not pleased with them. Why? Because Cain didn't give his best to God. He gave the second best to God. And Cain was exceedingly angry, and his countenance fell. He was angry, jealous, envious. Why? Because when God would have received the sacrifice of Cain, or Abel, God would send fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifice. And they all saw this, and, that, and God was pleased. But that didn't happen with Cain. It only happened with Abel's lambs. And the Lord said to Cain, Why art thou angry, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou do well, shalt thou not receive. If you do well, that means if you offer your best, I will bless you. But since you offer me the second best and the third best, and even the worst, this is how you treat God, and you won't be blessed. But if you do ill, that is, offer the worst, shall not sin forthwith be present at the door. But the lust thereof shall be under thee, and thou shalt have dominion over it. And Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go forth abroad. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and slew him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is thy brother Abel? And he answered, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? So he's, being, he's a smart mouth to Almighty God. He's a smart mouth. I don't know. Am I supposed to look after my brother? And he said to him, God said to Cain, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth to me from the earth. So, the blood of murder cries to heaven. The blood of millions and millions of abortions today cries to heaven for vengeance. Now therefore cursed shalt thou be upon the earth, which hath opened her mouth and received the blood of thy brother at thy hand. So that's the literal 
story. That's the actual historical account. And this we believe. We believe every word of Scripture because it has the authority of God behind it. It's the highest authority. So it's the most true and the most dependable and not uh, deceiving and not just myth. As the modernists try to tear the Scriptures apart by calling it myth or just, pre or just empty uh, symbols. So what does this really mean? Well, let's turn again to our great fathers of the church, St. Augustine, St. Gregory, St. Bede the Venerable, and St. An uh, uh, Ambrose. Here's what they say. Cain symbolizes the Jews. Abel, our Lord Jesus Christ. Abel offers of sacrifice most pleasing to God. He offers his best. Our Lord Jesus Christ will offer the best, which is himself, to God. And he is the living lamb, as St. John the Baptist points out, at John News Day. Behold, there's the Lamb of God. And the priest at Mass will hold Christ up, at John News Day. Behold, here is the Lamb. So the best that Christ offers is his total self, the most pleasing sacrifice to God. And that sacrifice is our Lord. Notice our Lord in his physical physical, corporal body, he offers himself in the prime of his youth. He's 33 years old. He's, that's when some athletes are actually their best, their strongest and wisest on the ice or on the field or on the court. So Christ allows him, his whole life to be cut at the prime of his youth for the, to satisfy the justice to God the Father to open the gates of heaven and save us from hell. So Christ is that lamb most pleasing to God, the Father and the Holy Ghost. So what happens? Cain gets jealous. Remember the Jews, they wanted to kill Christ before Passover. And when they saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, some of them vowed, we will not eat till we kill him. This is the jealousy that was in their hearts yeah. in the high priest. So they vowed to kill our Lord because they didn't want the Redeemer to be the way our Lord was. Humble, meek, strong to defend the honor of God. Strong to defend the house of God and drive the money changers out of the temple with fury and anger of God. And they didn't want this. They wanted... The Redeemer to be the way Christ will be at his second coming. Mm. With fire coming before his throne and all the millions of angels and legions serving and glorifying him. But Christ wanted to teach us the way to go to heaven is to be walk humble of heart. And humble ourselves and love God and follow our Lord and all his virtues. So the Jews, symbolized by Cain, got jealous. Let's go forth abroad, Cain said to Abel. Let's go for a long walk. Take him outside the city and crucify him on the west side, on Golgotha. And then they, they, uh, Cain slew his brother, and the blood cried to heaven. And God heard the voice of the blood. That's very interesting. And St. Paul will say, there is no without remission, excuse me, without the shedding of blood. Without shedding of Christ's precious blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And that's what the sacraments give us. This is why the sacraments are so precious. They really are the heart of Jesus touching us. That's why it's the absolute absurdity and insanity for the heretics, starting with Luther, to reject the sacraments and pick and choose and they reject especially the most powerful sacraments that pour out the love and the burning heart of the the love of our Lord's Sacred Heart confession which was rejected by the Protestants and the holy sacrifice of the Mass giving us the Holy Eucharist they reject the most powerful sacraments and the Holy Eucharist is the center of them all because it's Christ himself so we must love, love the seven sacraments. These are the fountains of grace. They give 
fruit to the soul. They sanctify the souls, but they also sanctify even the physical place. Mrs. Pfeiffer often, she often said to me, Pete, the neighbors used to say when Father Hannafin came down and established in 1972, the chapel there and kept the Blessed Sacrament, the neighbors said, there's something different about this place now. The whole place has changed. There's like a piece about the whole area. And, and, that's the, and I've heard that in other churches. In St. Louis, when I was there with Father Stanich years ago in the 90s, uh, he bought the church which was downtown, right in the middle of downtown. So you got all the, all the riffraff walking around. But with the Blessed Sacrament there, it affected the city. And there came uh, a greater cleanliness, a greater peace about the place. And that happens wherever the Blessed Sacrament is. Christ's presence is, affects the physical place. But all the more, the soul and the outpouring of the precious blood of our Lord in the, in the sacrifice of the Mass. Archbishop Lefebvre gives a sermon where he says that the, the power of the Mass even shakes down into hell. All the damned feel when there's a Mass being offered on the earth. They all feel the rumblings and the power of it, especially the devils. And they rage with fury against God, because that's the power of the Mass. So it's no wonder that Daniel is going to say, Daniel will live about the year 600 years before Christ. Here's what he's going to say. No, therefore, and take notice. This is chapter 9, verse 25 of Daniel the prophet. That from the going forth of the word to build up Jerusalem again unto Christ the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 490 years from Esdras to Christ. Mm -hmm. And the street shall be built again in the walls in straightness of times. And after 62 weeks, Christ shall be slain. Christ, the true Abel, will be slain. And the people, the Cains, that shall deny him shall not be his, because they will reject him. And a people, that is the non-Jews, or the converted Jews, and a people with their leader that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So he's talking here about Rome, coming in under Vespasian and Titus, and sacking of, of, of Jerusalem, coming to sack Jerusalem. They shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be waste. Remember what Christ said, there will not be a stone upon a stone. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact. That's why the, 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 what's called today the Wailing Wall, the Wailing Wall was not part of the real Jerusalem. There was no stone upon a stone. It's not the real part of Jerusalem. They say it's part of the temple, but it's not. Mm -hmm. The Wailing Wall is, is, a, is a gimmick. It's not the real one. Because Christ said everything will, there won't be a stone left upon a stone. God's miraculous hand was helping the Romans to destroy Jer Jerusalem for the sin of deicide. Mm. And then Daniel concludes, And after the end of the war, the appointed desolation. And he shall confirm the covenant with many in one week. And in the half of the week, the victim and the sacrifice shall fail. And there shall be in the temple... Abominate the abomination of desolation, and the desolation shall continue even to the consummation and to the end. And many good priests, including, of course, a great Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, they made always this connection. The abomination of desolation certainly today applies to the new Mass. With the table of Thomas Cramner in the sanctuary, the destruction of the old altar, the, the, the abolition, the destruction of the old mass. This is the abomination of desolation. Man adored in the place of God. Man in the center, Christ mm -hmm. and God on the, in, behind man, or even in a closet. And this is so well expressed by the new mass. 
This is the new mass foretold by Daniel the prophet. And what does it say about the new mass? What is one of their prayers? We offer you, Father, the works of human hands. That's a prayer taken from a Jewish prayer. And notice what you just heard in Genesis. What did Cain offer that displeased God? The work of human hands. The fruit of the vine and work of human hands. So the new mass even has the words of its own condemnation, tying it close to Cain's rejected sacrifice. Because he didn't give God the best, but only second and third best. So what do we learn from all this? We always must try to give God the best. Give Him the best of our intelligence. Mm -hmm. Take time every day to meditate, to take, take time every day to converse with God in a very close way, a very loving way, a very childlike way to our Heavenly Father. He loves this. This is what our Lord wants from us. This childlike mm -hmm. to our Father, this, this closeness. And he, he even brings it closer, he, uh, as between the closest of friends and the closest of lovers. And St. Bernard will go off on long sermons talking about Christ, the spouse of the soul, the greatest of all lovers of the soul, who died for those he loves. And he, no man, mm -hmm. as our Lord said, no greater love than this can any man have than to lay down his life for his friends. So what's going to happen at every Mass? What's going to happen very soon on this altar? Christ lays down His life for His friends, for you, for the souls in purgatory, for all those on earth, for all those in this town of Hubbardston and all Massachusetts and all the Northeast. It affects the whole earth, the power of the Mass. Mm -hmm. So let's give God first the best of our intelligence, the best of our affections. Mm -hmm. Our greatest love must be for God. Yeah, but I'm married. Yeah, you must love your spouse, but love them in God. Love them in God. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, Bishop Sheen said, that's a mistake many people make when they get married. They make their spouse almost in the place of God. Mm -hmm. But a true happy marriage is to love your spouse in God. As he said, three get married. Your spouse, you, and the Blessed Trinity. So give God our highest love. Give Him our highest honor, our adoration. And then uh, sacrifice the daily battles of the, the war of the flesh and the spirit. The daily battles of the seven capital sins that wage in us war. And we have to wage war against them mm -hmm. with violence and the help of prayer and the Holy Ghost. And we look to the Virgin Mary. She's the model of the perfect garden, perfectly pleasing to God in every way. In her garden, there's not one weed, there's not one little rat, there's not one thing displeasing to God in her. Mm -hmm. So she's the one we want to turn to, to help us, teach us, give us the grace, give me the grace to love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my strength, with all my soul, and to love my neighbor for the love of thee. In this we fulfill the highest law and the highest of all the laws. Mm -hmm. And this is what every Mass does. It fulfills the highest law. The highest law of love of God. Christ lays down His sacrifice on the Calvary to God. That's reenacted on the altar. And then the greatest love of neighbor. He lays down His, reenacts His death for all of us to save all souls of goodwill from hell. If only we will turn to Him, thirst for Him, and love Him in return. So let's turn to the Virgin Mary asking these graces and beg these graces. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.